this, including the carry-on and black dot forms of this condition. However, there are still several important aspects of alopecia that remain to be covered. After all, what is the pathogenesis of telogen effluvium? How do we treat androgenetic alopecia both in our male and female patients? What sign can we look for on physical exam in diagnosing a patient with traction alopecia? And lastly, how do we diagnose and manage psychiatric contributions to alopecia, such as trichotillomania? We answer all these questions and more in this exciting video of Boards MD. In part one of our alopecia video series, we covered the three components of the physical exam that are essential in evaluating our patients with alopecia. If you need a review of the scalp examination, hair pull test, or tug test, I highly recommend you revisit part one of this video series. If you've mastered that physical exam, however, let's delve into the first of our conditions that we present in this part two of our video series, which is telogen effluvium. In telogen effluvium, our classic patient is going to be a young or middle-aged woman who presents with acute, diffuse, non-inflammatory hair loss. And the real key in the history of board vignettes for patients with telogen effluvium is the presence of triggers. These triggers in telogen effluvium are essentially stressors that are placed on the patient and which are ultimately at the root of this type of alopecia. Common triggers which show up on examinations include pregnancy, surgery, stressors, including psychosocial stressors, such as divorce or losing a job, as well as menstrual bleeding. The pathophysiology of telogen effluvium is loss of telogen hairs at their roots, which results in shedding of these hairs. In order to understand what we mean by telogen hairs, let's do a brief review of the hair cycle. In the hair cycle, there are three key phases, the antigen phase, the catagen phase, and the telogen phase. At the medical student level, we do not really need to know these phases in extreme detail, but it will suffice for our purposes to know that the antigen phase is essentially a growth phase of the hair, the catagen phase is a transitional phase, and the telogen phase is essentially the rest phase of the hair cycle. And the important thing to know for the purposes of telogen effluvium is that if a patient is exposed to a significant stressor, such as pregnancy or any of the triggers that we mentioned on the previous slide, then that patient can lose up to 70% of their hairs that are currently in the resting or telogen phase. And this is a principle that is frequently tested on examinations. We have here a schematic of a classic case of telogen effluvium, and there are a few important keys to note here. First, you should notice that this does not follow a typical androgenetic pattern which is something we will go into in more detail in the coming slides later in this video. The other key is to notice that in telogen effluvium, the hair loss is going to be diffuse and not simply focal. As we can see, we have this hair loss occurring in multiple areas throughout the scalp. And the final key characteristic of telogen effluvium, as we mentioned on our presentation slide, is that the hair loss in this case is going to be non-inflammatory. Please note in this schematic that there is no erythema, scale, or any other evidence of inflammation, thus characterizing telogen effluvium as a non-inflammatory diffuse hair loss. In telogen effluvium, it should be noted that on physical exam, there is going to be normal scalp and hair density. This is because hairs during the telogen phase are being shedded directly from their root. This is also why if you were to examine the hairs that are shed from a patient with telogen effluvium, you will be able to appreciate that the hair will be present with a visible bulb. And this could be appreciated in this clinical photograph where we can clearly see this bulb at the end of the hair and this signifies that the telogen hair was being shedded directly from its root. In addition, because there is active hair shedding during telogen effluvium, it should be noted that these patients will have a positive hair pull test. And this is extremely high yield to keep in mind. In addition, there are several labs that we may get in the case of a patient with telogen effluvium where there is an unclear stressor or etiology present. In this case, we may order a CBC to evaluate for anemia, a TSH and T4 to evaluate for thyroid disease, vitamin D to evaluate for a vitamin deficiency, RPR as an initial test for syphilis, and ferritin to assess for iron deficiency 
because as we mentioned previously, menstrual bleeding can be an important cause of telogen effluvium as well as alopecias in general. And for these patients, simply restoring their iron with iron supplementation can help to resolve their alopecia. The hallmarks of managing our patients with telogen effluvium is ultimately going to be education as well as reassurance. As with resolving of the emotional stressor that initially triggered the episode of telogen effluvium in the first place, the alopecia will ultimately also resolve, and therefore the hair loss should not be permanent. If we find any more potential lab abnormalities that may be contributing to the telogen effluvium, it is also essential that we treat the underlying cause, as iron supplementation, for example, can be extremely helpful in these patients. In addition, while it has mixed clinical evidence, we will also sometimes supplement with the use of minoxidil. Although this is normally used in angiogenetic alopecia, we will sometimes use this as a supplementary rather than primary treatment in patients with telogen effluvium. This provides us with a great transition into androgenetic alopecia, which classically on examinations is going to occur in a middle-aged male. There are two key components of the hair loss that define androgenetic alopecia in males. These include crown balding as well as the presence of a receding hairline. This can be appreciated by the picture on the right-hand side of our screen where we can clearly see that this middle-aged male patient has a receding hairline and he also has the presence of crown balding, as can be appreciated here. It is important to note that the pathophysiology of androgenetic alopecia is driven by 5-dihydrotestosterone, also known as 5-DHT. As it turns out, 5-DHT is extremely important in the development of the pilosebaceous unit in the dermal papillae. In males with androgenetic alopecia, interestingly enough, have elevated levels of 5-alpha reductase, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone into 5-DHT. And as we will see in a moment in our management of this condition, inhibiting 5-alpha reductase can be extremely helpful in treating our patients with this condition. It should also be noted that as indicated in the name androgenetic, androgenetic alopecia has been shown to have an important genetic component. Now that we have seen a clinical photograph of androgenetic alopecia in a male, let us also take a look at a schematic to illustrate the stages of male pattern baldness. We can see on the left-hand side of our screen that we are first starting with some subtle indications of a receding hairline. And if we look at the vertex scalp, we can also start to see some preliminary evidence of some crown balding. This then progresses to a point where the receding hairline becomes far more obvious, as well as the crown balding, and ultimately, this process continues until we are left with simply this crown of hair around the rim, with significant alopecia both in the frontal and vertex scalp. In contrast to our male patients, in our female patients with androgenetic alopecia, we are not going to see that same receding hairline that we see in our male patients. Instead, we will classically see a thinning of the hair, which is most present in the vertex and to some degree in the frontal scalp. This ultimately gave rise to what we refer to as the Ludwig scale for female androgenetic alopecia. This divides female pattern hair loss into stage 1, which is relatively mild thinning, stage 2, which is more moderate thinning, and stage 3, which is more significant and severe thinning of the hair. Because of the highly characteristic physical exam in patients with androgenetic alopecia, the diagnosis is going to be clinical there is really no need for a biopsy. In order to treat androgenetic alopecia, we can use topical minoxidil, which you may see marketed under the brand name Rogaine. This is a vasodilator which works by opening up potassium channels. Or we can also use oral finasteride, which is also used in the case of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Due to its mechanism of action in inhibiting 5-alpha reductase, which converts testosterone into 5-DHT. In addition, patients with more advanced hair loss can also benefit from the use of hair transplant surgery. And this is particularly true when there are larger patches of alopecia involved, which are less likely to respond to minoxidil or finasteride. Moving on to traction alopecia, this condition presents with reduced hair length as well as reduced hair density, particularly involving the frontal as well as the temporal scalp. The key in recognizing traction alopecia in question stems is to also look for the triggers that ultimately cause this condition to occur. These triggers include the use of braids, hair extensions, ponytails, locks, 
and chemical relaxers. The reason that all of these triggers can lead to alopecia is that they result in chronic traction of the hair and scalp. This traction ultimately leads to inflammation, which over time can cause scarring, resulting in permanent loss of hair. At the bottom of our screen, we have two examples of hair styles that can ultimately lead to traction alopecia. These include the use of locks, as we see on the left-hand side of our screen, as well as the use of braids here, as you can see here in the image on the right-hand side of our screen. One very key sign that we can see on physical exam in patients with traction alopecia is called the fringe sign. The fringe sign occurs when there are retained hairs, particularly along the temporal and frontal rim, which is exactly where patients with traction alopecia are most affected. In addition to our schematic, we also have a clinical image here showing the fringe sign, where we can clearly see both in the temporal and frontal scalp that there are these retained hairs present and this fringe sign has a very high sensitivity and specificity for traction alopecia. You can also look for hints in the clinical image in terms of the actual style that the patient is wearing, as it is clear from this image that this hairstyle can certainly produce some traction on the scalp. The hallmark of management in patients with alopecia is ultimately going to be education, as we need to educate our patients on the impact that locks, braids, and other hairstyles can have in terms of producing alopecia in the long term. Therefore, if we are able to intervene early enough, the real key in management is going to be to DC the traction and to stop using hairstyles that are contributing to the inflammation and scarring. As a supplementary treatment, you may also see some clinicians use minoxidil or other treatments such as a topical corticosteroid. However, the efficacy of these is quite limited compared to lifestyle modification. In addition, because traction alopecia is ultimately a scarring alopecia, the hair loss can be permanent, and if we intervene too late, then the condition can be irreversible. And this is why, again, it is so important that we educate our patients about how their hairstyles may be contributing to their hair loss. Moving on to our final high-yield alopecia condition, which is trichotillomania, these patients classically present with irregular patches of hair loss with varying lengths. This aspect of varying lengths in these patches of hair loss in trichotillomania is very important to keep in mind because ultimately these patients are actually pulling out their own hairs. And therefore, each time that they pull out a patch of hair, they may pull directly from the root or they may break the actual strand of hair part of the way up the shaft. And this is what results in the varying lengths of these patches of alopecia. It should be noted that trichotillomania is more common in women, and therefore you're more likely to see this in a female patient on examinations. The pathophysiology of trichotillomania isn't entirely understood However, it does seem to have a serotonergic component. This is consistent with the fact that trichotillomania is often comorbid in patients who have obsessive compulsive disorder or major depressive disorder, which both have serotonin as a significant aspect of their underlying pathophysiologies. Therefore, in vignettes for patients with trichotillomania, you may see that they have either OCD or MDD because of this association. According to the DSM criteria for trichotillomania, the diagnosis requires that the patient has recurrent hair pulling despite an attempt to stop. Therefore, the hair pulling that we see in trichotillomania is quite similar to the compulsions that we see in obsessive compulsive disorder. It should also be noted that in order to have this diagnosis, the recurrent hair pulling must cause distress or impairment on the part of the patient. And as we discuss further in our psychiatry videos, the recurrent hair pulling must not be due to body dysmorphic disorder. It is also very high yield to keep in mind that patients with trichotillomania on physical exam will have a negative hair pull test. This is because the actual integrity of their hair is normal and they are not having active shedding. This is unlike some of the other conditions that we have seen thus far with a positive hair pull test, including for some patients with androgenetic alopecia, telogen effluvium, and even alopecia areata. In order to manage patients with trichotillomania, we use cognitive behavioral therapy, abbreviated as CBT, and specifically, we use a subtype of CBT called habit reversal training. CBT is ultimately first line for this condition, However, given its serotonergic pathophysiology, if we do need to resort to the use of psychiatric medications, we can use selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, 
After that, we can progress to the use of clomipramine, which as we discussed in the psychiatry videos is a second line agent for obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as trichotillomania. And lastly, in rare cases, we may progress to the use of atypical antipsychotics or even N-acetylcysteine. However, it should really be noted that CBT is the hallmark of therapy in these patients. It should be noted, of course, that there are several other conditions which can cause alopecia, as in this alopecia video series, we have really tried to hone in on the highest yield material for examination purposes. Other causes of alopecia include secondary syphilis, which classically presents with a moth-eaten appearance, and this is evident in the image on the right-hand side of our screen, where this alopecia would be described as having a moth-eaten appearance. Other causes of alopecia include polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, discoid lupus erythematosus, various scarring alopecias, which, while very interesting clinically, are ultimately beyond the scope of medical school examinations, thyroid disease, including both hyper- and hypothyroidism, zinc deficiency, as well as several other mineral and vitamin deficiencies, which we cover in detail in our pediatric videos, as well as methotrexate and many other chemotherapeutic agents, which interfere with the cell cycle and rapid cell division and hair growth. In conclusion, we have covered some extremely high-yield alopecia conditions. For telogen effluvium, absolutely be on the lookout for a stressful event, which appears to trigger the onset of hair loss as that is very classic on examinations. In androgenetic alopecia, you should know the pattern of hair loss for both male and female patients, as well as the role that is played by 5-DHT. For traction alopecia, be on the lookout for hair modifications or styles, such as braids, locks, or ponytails, as well as, of course, the fringe sign. And for trichotillomania, look for irregular patches of hair loss with varying lengths, especially if the question writers give you a negative hair pull test. As we conclude our alopecia video series, there are many high-yield dermatologic topics that remain for us to cover. So please review these notes at your leisure, and I'll see you in the next video.